Howdy, and welcome to the second lecture for Astronomy 103 Astronomy. As you can probably see from my screen, I have just recorded the second lecture, which talks about telescopes. And so in this lecture, you'll find out about the basic types of telescopes, why uh, we populate the adage, bigger is better, and why we put telescopes where we put them. Essentially, we'll talk about why the at or what the atmosphere does to astronomical observations. And so what, what do astronomers have to do in order to mitigate those factors? Lecture three will then get into the subjects of astronomy more specifically. We'll get into uh, the Big Bang and the beginnings of the universe. In terms of what uh, you, is expected of you, um, I know that uh, unfortunately I had to cancel in-person class today, but what I would like is by Monday for all of you to have the Top Hat service. And so we will be using Top Hat extensively for both quizzes and for um, a lecture activity in class on Monday. So please have Top Hat by then. I will more than likely be putting out another video over the court, uh, over the uh, over the weekend, but for Monday, what you will be responsible for is the information from lectures one and two. That will be those are the questions that are asked at the beginning of class on Monday. All right, I think that's all the announcements that I have. So I hope you enjoy. It. All right, well, <laughs> I didn't even notice. I believe we're we're live. Well, MRX anyway. Howdy. All right. So, lecture two. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about tools of the astronomer. Ooh. Basically, we're going to talk about telescopes. Primarily, we're going to talk about telescopes. I love me some telescopes. I will tell you that right now. One of the reasons why I love doing the job that I have is because I have access to telescopes. Um, I don't know what it is about it. I don't know what it is about getting my hands dirty, as it were, um, fiddling around with, with them, trying to improve them, trying to uh, automate them. It's just one of the perks of the job, I guess. In terms of telescopes, um, as it may not be a life adage, it is in terms of telescopes, bigger is better. The larger a telescope you have, the more information you can acquire, and the more information uh, you can acquire, obviously the better science you can do. And so telescopes have, as it says, have really changed our understanding of the universe. Prior to telescopes, all we were left with was the, basically the telescopes of our own eyes, which are, in certain ways, um, rather ingenious and rather amazing devices, but in other ways are very rudimentary. Um, they're particularly very, very small, and so the amount of light that they can collect is also commensurately very small, and so that limits the the limits our view of the vastness of space. It really wasn't until telescopes were uh, were invented that we knew that we were part of a much larger universe. Galileo used his telescope in 19, uh, in 1609 to identify that the Milky Way galaxy or the Milky Way the, the band of colors that we, or the, the white band, the cloudy band that goes across the sky in very dark skies, that was actually composed of smaller stars, not some nebulous cloud feature. And so it, uh, it opened up the possibility that the universe was much larger than they had even possibly imagined. So, what a telescope does is it's a light bucket. It collects light. Light, as hopefully you gain from uh, the previous lecture, is a communicator of energy or a communicator of information. And so the more light, the more information that we can collect, the better things are. And it's basically two reasons. One, the larger telescope, uh, the larger a telescope. And when I talk about uh, telescope size, really what I'm talking about is aperture or girth, as it were is how large around is the primary collecting instrument, either be that the mirror or be that a lens. 
what is the aperture of the telescope? That's typically what you refer to as the size of the telescope um, moving forward. The, the rest of the, the, encase, the encasement of the, the telescope grows, obviously, commensurately uh, larger, but there are certain caveats to that, which I'll get into uh, later on. But a simple, um, sim by simple geometry, the amount of information that we get from a telescope is, uh, is related to the area of the aperture. And that area is, um, four, or is pi d squared over r. So if you, have, if you compare two telescopes, one of which is, um, one of which is twice as large as the other one, you get four times the information from the larger telescope. If one is five times larger, you get 25 uh, times the information or the light collected from that larger telescope. So that's, for example, the five meter tele or the five meter uh, Palomar telescope in comparison to our 0.8 meter is slightly larger than 25 times more information at Palomar than it is here. Now, what does that really, uh, what does that uh, mean in a more specific way? Uh, and I talk about more information, but what, uh, what does that uh, really mean? Well, for one thing, it means more light means that we can see fainter objects. So, faint objects do not put out a whole lot of light. Or, by the time the light gets to us, it's attenuated to the point that you don't get to see, or it's very difficult to collect that light, or particularly uh, over any... Um, any long period of time. And so the larger the bucket, the more likely you're going to uh, collect the light, the few photons, a few particles of light that are coming from that fainter object. So that's why we we're able to, see, uh, why Galileo was able to see those stars in the Milky Way galaxy as individual stars as opposed to, um, uh, as opposed to just a bland, uh, white, cloudy uh, feature. Another reason is angular resolution. This is really the primary reason he was able to distinguish this. Angular resolution is the ability to see fine detail. The way I like to, to, uh, to imagine angular resolution is imagine you're on a long stretch of highway and behind you is a car with their headlights on. Now let's assume that cars are fairly uniform and there's about one meter of separation laterally between uh, one headlight to the next. When the car is near to you, those headlights appear to be fairly well separated. If you were to draw an angle between those two, that angle would be pretty large. If you were to hit the accelerator and move uh, and begin accelerating beyond that or beyond at a larger distance, so you put more distance between you and that car, you would notice that the headlights appear to get smaller or get closer and closer together. That angular separation of the headlights gets smaller and smaller. Now, obviously, the lateral separation, the, um, the, the linear separation between those two headlights is still one meter, but it appears to you from an angular perspective that the headlights are getting closer and closer together to a point where as you reach a limit, the, the two headlights will actually appear to merge into one and they will only appear to uh, appear as a single source, as a single light in the, on the front of the vehicle. At the mo and it is at the moment that you lose the ability to distinguish those two lights as separate, in, uh, separate objects, that is what we call your, resol uh, your angular resolution limit or diffraction limit. Because essentially what that means is once you get to that point, you can no longer determine the detail of one headlight with respect to the other. It's all one just kind of amalgam blob. Uh, on the slide shows you some exa or an example of, of what angular resolution can give you. So we're looking at a planetary nebula. I know the one on the right looks more impressive because it's in color, but really what you need to be focusing on is the ability to see detail. So, the, uh, so we're looking at the same planetary nebula, or the same cloud of gas, which is the remnant of a star very much like our sun, uh, which is illuminated by the white dwarf in the, in the center of it. 
if you have a small aperture telescope, you you can see the light. The light still reaches us. That light gets to us. And so the telescope is going to collect it and is going to uh, focus it onto some kind of uh, imaging uh, platform like a CCD camera or digital camera or photographic plate or, or something. We, can, we have collected and we can see the photon. But we cannot see is the detail, is essentially the contrast, the fine contrast between light and dark uh, neighboring areas. So it looks blurry. And so, but if you were to look at the same object using a much larger telescope, you might see something that looks like the right, where you have that the, the object is much clearer in focus. Well, appears to be much clearer in focus. We haven't really, ch we haven't changed the focus. We've changed the aperture size. But the reason why it appears to be in focus is because you can see finer detail. Now, if you got, went to an even larger telescope, you would see even finer detail than that within that um, within that nebula. Stuff that you couldn't uh, currently see, say, in the outer ring that, again, looks fuzzy. That There is structure there. There is definitive structure there that you are missing even in the more... Uh, with the larger aperture telescope. So you need even larger aperture telescopes in order to see that kind of small, fine detail. So if we have any hope of looking at the environments around supermassive black holes at the centers of other galaxies, we're going to need extremely large telescopes, or as they're known in astronomy, ELTs. I know, astronomers don't really have, uh, aren't really creative in their name. If we want to find, if we want to find uh, exoplanets, we want to find a habitable exoplanet. If we want to know where a planet that is um, that is situated in such a way that can support life, has a thick, a thick enough atmosphere, has water on its surface, in order to find those, we really need to, uh, a large telescope in order to be able to see the detail of those uh, of those features on these uh, exoplanets. At the moment, we can only really indirectly image the, or indirectly uh, study these exoplanets and only come up with their bulk characteristics, their masses, their uh, radii, and so, uh, so on. So we, they're very model dependent as to, we believe this type of, of planet is, a, is probably gaseous in nature. This is primarily a water world. This is probably a super terrestrial planet. Um, but we don't know for absolute certainty because we need larger telescopes to see much finer detail. The angular resolution of a telescope is based on this equation here. Again, I will never ask you to actually calculate anything. This is all about understanding the relationships between quantities. A is the angular resolution that you can see. So you want A to be as small as possible. Um, because it means that if you can see if there is an angular separation which is larger than A, then your telescope has the ability to see it as two distinct objects, or the, you can see the fine detail, the fine print, as it were. Now, there's a constant feature, uh, constant uh, value in there that's basically a uh, unit um, unit conversion tool. Like I said, constant thing. You don't need to really worry about it. The two things that depend on the angular resolution are the wavelength of light and the size of the telescope. So let's focus on the size of the telescope because that's what we've been talking about. As you can see, it's inversely related. So the larger the telescope, the smaller A is going to be. So the larger the telescope, the finer the detail you can see. The longer the wavelength you are looking at, so now we're looking, now let's take the uh, idea that you are looking, you're using the same telescope, but you're looking in two different uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's say somehow uh, if you were looking at, uh, you had a camera which was sensitive to the infrared and camera which is sensitive to the visible. The infrared uh, camera, because it has a longer wavelength, is not going to give you as fine detail as the camera that is in the visible part of the spectrum simply because of this relationship. The angular resolution degrades as you get to longer and longer wavelengths. When you get to shorter and shorter wavelengths, the angular res resolution actually improves. Now, there's a way that astronomers can get around this, um, particularly if they want to get fine detail 
for radio, uh, radio observations, and that is through interferometry, which we'll talk about uh, momentarily. So again, the angular resolution of fine detail, you want that as small as possible which means you want to observe either using the largest telescope possible or in the shortest wave or shortest wavelengths possible. So there are two major types of telescopes. There is refracting telescopes and there is reflecting telescopes. Refracting telescope uses lenses. They use lenses uh, so the starlight comes in on this, it comes in from the right, hits the lens, the lens causes the, the uh, light rays to bend due to refraction, and that light ray, uh, those light uh, rays get focused to a point, which then collect get collected by either an eyepiece or a digital camera or a photographic plate or some recording instrument. Um, that you, some recording instrument. Reflecting telescope, and there are a number of subtypes of reflecting telescope, but the reflecting telescope seen here is the Newtonian uh, variety. It's the one that was developed by uh, Isaac Newton. And so again, you have the uh, light coming in from the right. It passes through the tube, hits the refractor, or the, the mirror at the back of the uh, tube, down, uh, reflects that light to a secondary flat mirror near the top of the tube, and then out the side of the tube to, again, a focus where there is some sort of recording instrument, eyepiece, camera, etc. Today, reflecting telescopes, in terms of research-grade uh, telescopes, reflecting telescopes are almost, almost exclusively reflecting. Research telescopes, excuse me, are almost exclusively reflecting telescopes, and there are uh, significant reasons why. So the differences or the di disadvantages of a refracting telescope um, are pretty much twofold. Um, one. Because of the design, because obviously you have to have light passing through a lens, the lens can only be supported on its edge. And so what that means is when the lens is, um, when, the, uh, when the lens is supported by the edge, the middle is the middle, which is the thickest part of the lens, is not nearly as supported as well the edges are. And so if you build a large enough lens, gravity will actually deform that lens to the point that it can no longer be used to bring anything into a focus or anything into a fine focus. So it is physically impossible to create a lens that is stable under its own mass larger than around one meter. So you're limited in that, in that sense. Uh, it also becomes prohibitively expensive to do so, uh, to even try to do so. The other issue is the focal length. The basically, the if we go back, you can see that this is uh, this is what we call an unfolded light path. The light travels pretty much from point A on the right through the telescope to point B. It's just a linear one direction path. It doesn't reflect. It doesn't fold back in on itself. It doesn't get reflected back in and itself. The distance between the eyepiece or where you would place your detecting instrument and the objective is known as the focal length or how long it takes for the objective to bring something to a focus onto, um, onto a detecting device. The larger the, generally speaking, the larger the objective, the longer the focal length. And so, right now, the largest uh, the largest refra uh, refracting telescope in the United States is 60 centimeters, and that's at the Yerkes Obser uh, Observatory. And it is immense. It is so large to the point that they actually had to put the floor on an elevator so that when the telescope was pointed directly upwards, you could get to the bottom of the telescope, but when the telescope slewed so that, so here, if you're standing there, the telescope is pointing uh, pretty much up, then you can easily uh, reach the eyepiece or the camera or what have you at the back end of the telescope. But when the telescope is pointing towards something low on the horizon, uh, this is now tens of feet above the floor. And so the way, uh, the only way that an observer can get to this location is either a, a really big ladder 
or actually make the floor into a little bit of an elevator, which actually rises as the telescope tilts. So it drops down as the telescope slews upward and then rises up as the telescope uh, slews downward. Which is really cool, but imagine we now have research grade telescopes that are 10 times that size. Imagine the engineering involved in trying to create, if even if we could create a mirror that was 10, um, 10 meters in size, or excuse me, create a lens which was 10 meters in size, which isn't possible, the superstructure surrounding that would be immense. Just the long and the tube would be um, hundreds of yards in size. Also, um, and so basically th those are the two major problems is that uh, one, it is impossible to build a precision lens larger than one meter because its own mass will cause it to deform. And two, even if you could bypass that one, the structural engineering of, to cr actually create the, the tube so that the tube itself doesn't bend under its own weight would also be prohibitive. And in addition to this, you have something known as chromatic aberration. As you remember from the first lecture, uh, light, as it passes through a prism, or in this case, a lens, not all of the light bends equally. Red light bends far more than blue light does. And so what you have is, if you looked at a really bright white source, like a, a really bright white star, you would notice there is a rainbow pattern of color which emanates off of it. You would see a blue ring around the, the core of, you'd see a white core and then a blue ring and then an orange ring and then, or a yellow ring and then an orange ring around that. You would see a little bit of a rainbow uh, aberration coming off the star itself. And that's simply because of the, the lenses involved. Now you can correct for that to a certain extent by adding more lenses, um, basically creating a compound objective as we call it. Uh, but again, you start getting into the mass problem. If the lenses, if the combination of lenses is, uh, is massive enough, then it's going to cause the lens to distort. So advantages of reflectors. Why do we use reflectors? Well, we use reflectors because of basically two reasons. One, we can support them from the back. You can support them across the entire aperture. And so their weight doesn't cause, the weight of the, the mirror itself or the glass itself doesn't, um, or can be, equal, can be equally supported and so it doesn't distort. The curvature that we need, the precise shape of the mirror can be kept intact uh, because it is supported in that way. Also, if you remember the, the Newtonian, reflecting by its very nature is a folded light path. The light comes in from one direction, gets bounced off the other, uh, gets bounced off one mirror into another direction, bounces off another mirror into another direction. And so as you get larger in aperture, the focal length is folded. And so you don't need as long a telescope as you would if you were um, using a refracting telescope. And so from an engineering standpoint, it's easier to build a, you know, if you were to look at a 10 meter uh, telescope, um, it's much easier and much more cost effective to build a uh, 10 meter reflecting telescope than it is a 10 meter uh, refracting telescope. Because again, building a 10 meter diameter lens is damn near impossible. If not impossible, you certainly, it won't, it certainly will not keep its shape and its ability to uh, create fine focus for any length of time whatsoever. Now, I, I was going to bring this up during uh, talking about radio telescopes, or basically talking about telescopes that look beyond the visible range of our eyes, basically uh, outside of the Roy G. Biff. But I love this story a little too much for that. So I like to say that radio astronomers are dirty, dirty cheaters because they can observe during the day, although not very often. The sun does cause some interference. They can observe when it's cloudy. Again, not very cloudy, but they can still get good data when it's cloudy. Um, and they can do interferometry really well. 
Now, what is interferometry? Interferometry is the ability to take data from multiple telescopes and then combine them in such a way to synthesize a telescope that has the diameter that is equal to the separations of the telescope. So, for example, if you had a telescope on the, if you had a telescope on, let's imagine the, the Earth uh, in California, and you had a telescope on, well, in New York, you had a telescope in LA and a telescope in Manhattan, a radio telescope in each of those locations, and you were to observe something, you could, in fact, get data with an angular resolution the same as if you had a radio telescope the size of the continental United States. So while you lose something in, in depth of field, and you lose something in that you can't see as faint as if you actually had a telescope that large, you gain the angular resolution as if the two telescopes were spaced that far apart, or if, as if the dish were that large. This is how radio gets around that angular resolution problem where it's tied to wavelength. If you were to a single dish, single what we call radio telescopes, they're dishes. They're not glass. They're um, the aperture uh, apertures are usually referred to as as dishes for some reason, like you know satellite dish. These things, whereas the largest telescopes on um, on Earth optically are ten meters in size or thirty feet roughly across. A 40-foot 40 40-foot 40 radio telescope is peanuts. Um, they can get all the way, they typically get on the order of hundreds of feet across, if not thousands of feet across. So, for example, Arecibo, which unfortunately, rest in peace, um, died fairly recently. The cranes, it was being decommissioned anyway, but one of the cranes had a catastrophic failure, and it, it's it, sad. Rest in peace. Anyway, the largest steerable telescope, Green Bank, is 100 meters in size, basically the size of a football field. So this is a single dish telescope that is the size of, of, um, wish we had a football team here, uh, you know, of Gator Stadium or the Swamp, moving around, uh, staring at the sky. So immense things in order to get, rid of, get around that wavelength dependence of the angular resolution, in order to get an angular resolution where they can see actually any kind of fine detail at all. Even that, even, this, even a telescope the size of a football field still is limiting to the science that they can do. They can still get the photons, they can still get the light, but the angular resolution is still too large for a lot of applications that they do. So radio uh, astronomers decided to get around that by developing this idea of interferometry, this idea of taking and recording data from one location and then looking at the same object with another uh, telescope from another location and then combining that, and that synthesizes an aperture or synthesizes a dish which has a resolution the size of the baseline, the size of the separation between the two. A famous picture you may have seen recently is of the black hole at the center of, um, is it M87, M82, M87, one of those, um, a giant elliptical galaxy um, millions of light years away. There is a supermassive black hole in it, and there is a, a beautiful image of this, of the basically accretion disk surrounding that black hole. And so you're looking at something that is less than the size of our solar system, from a distance of millions upon millions of light years. It's tiny. And the reason why we were able to do that is because of interferometry. We actually took data from uh, telescopes all around the globe. And so we synthesized a telescope that was the size of the Earth. And that is the Event Horizon Telescope, and that was its primary uh, design purpose, was to do just what it did. Getting back to this image. Now, and the fact that radio astronomers are dirty, dirty cheaters. Interferometry can be extended to other wavelength regimes. And so it can be extended into the optical. So you can use what we traditionally refer to as, what we traditionally think of as telescopes, and construct interferometers out of that. 
The problem becomes with radio waves, you can record the data from one uh, location and then combine it with a recording from another location. You cannot do that with optical telescopes. The wavelengths are too small and you cannot, uh, basically you cannot properly align uh, the data so that it appears at the d as if the data was taken simultaneously. Because that's really what the, the key thing is. It, it has to be, it has to, uh, the data has to be taken such that it's essentially the same, um, same wave. Anyway, not to get too far into the weeds, but with optical telescopes, you have to do it in real time. You have to combine the light in real time, which means you have to have a really flat area. Because light, you, you do not want to reflect the light too many times because a little bit of light gets lost during every reflection. And so you want everything to be on the same level. So this is the VLTI, or Very Large Telescope Interferometer, as the Europeans decided to name it. And the Europeans have a great um, relationship with the Chileans. Uh, Chile has been a, a has been a sort of a mecca for astronomy for uh, decades, if not centuries, at this point. Uh, Harvard would uh, go down into uh, to Chile and regularly put up telescopes there for their observations. The Harvard Observatory uh, would do that. The Europeans have uh, uh, taken up, and they have a very good relationship with the the, the Chileans, and they have a couple of, of three or four observatories down there. This is but one of them. Now, what I love about this story is when the, uh, when the, uh, the Europeans were looking for a site, they, they wanted to, they, again, they, this is in the Andes Mountains, so you're talking about a mountain range that is 14,000 feet above sea level, thereabouts, and they were looking for a place to, to put this thing, but as you, can, as you can see, it has a very large footprint. Um, this, these are large telescopes and they are fairly well spaced apart and they couldn't find a location naturally that was, that would accommodate them. They, they would be, the telescopes would be at different heights and it was just kind of a mess. Um, and they're like, well, you know, it'd be nice if we can do this, but, um, um, we can't find a level area. The Chilean said, no problem. And they dynamited the top off of one of their mountains, just just made that thing as flat as uh, flat as a sheet of ice, and then that's what they built the uh, the uh, very large telescope interferometer uh, on. So you can see that that area is not naturally that flat. They blew that on the mount the top of that mountain off in order to put those uh, telescopes there. Now, why am I going through all this? Is because you can do this with a um, with a telescope or with an interferometer, and this is actually a little bit outdated. So there is only one star, two stars. There are only two stars that you can resolve the surface of the star using a, tele, a single telescope. One of them is the Sun, and the other one is Betelgeuse, which is actually on this screen. The Hubble Space Telescope was able to resolve, kind of, sort of, the surface of Betelgeuse. And what I mean by kind of, sort of, it could tell that half of the surface was brighter than the other half. And that's it. That's as far as you get. If you want to know what's on the surface of certain stars, or even the shapes of certain stars, you really just have to model that. You have to, uh, there's no way to, there was no way to directly measure that until now. Using optical or infrared in, uh, interferometry, we now have the capability to resolve a certain subset of stars such that we can find out that they may be like Altair, where they're so rapidly rotating, they're actually squished at it to a major extent. Well, actually not squished. Let me back that up and say that they are blown out at their radi uh, at their equators because of the large centripetal force. The uh, the the star balloons out at the equator, and so that the equatorial radius is much larger than the the polar radius, and so they look like oblate spheroids. You may have heard that the Earth is an oblate spheroid, which is true, but these stars are much more noticeable. As you can see from the comparison between Altair, which is rapidly rotating, and Betelgeuse, which is not, and Betelgeuse is basically a sphere. We were also able to confirm with uh, that the Hubble, what well, Hubble was seeing was actually real. It wasn't some kind of strange artifact of the imaging, and that we were able to see surface features on, this, on the surface of 
of Betelgeuse. And I myself have uh, been part of the pioneering work of looking at dark star spots on the surface of, of stars and actually watching those, star, those, sa oh, those same spots rotate across the field of view of the, uh, of the telescope as the star itself rotates under it. And then um, perhaps one of my favorites is a friend of mine, Brian, was doing his observations for his dissertation at the same time that I was doing my observations, and we were competing to see who could take up as much telescope time as possible. Um, I think I won. I think I had the most data on, on the most night, but anyway, um, you know, geek trumping in his own horn. Anyway, what he was able to do with that data was there is a particular object that was a mystery for decades. It's called uh, Epsilon Auriga. And what was amazing about Epsilon Auriga was that every 27 years or so, it would dim considerably. It would dim on the order of uh, a few hundred times uh, its normal brightness. And it would do so for months. It would be dark, darker for months, and then it would go back to its normal brightness again and be fine for 20 some odd years, and then it would do it again. The idea was the the only um, and so there were a lot of ideas floating around as to what could be causing this, and the most popular idea was that there was a it's a binary system of two stars orbiting around a common center of mass, and they're aligned as such that one of them passes directly in front of the other one, which in and itself is not weird or really exotic. The, most stars are actually in binary systems or higher order. But what was strange about this one is that one of the stars was surrounded by an immense dust, dusty disk. And so the idea was that the main star was not just being eclipsed by a smaller companion, but being eclipsed by this disk-shaped object. And that's what Brian was able to do. That's what Brian was able to directly show, was he took an image of the star prior to the eclipse, found out it's pretty boring, it doesn't really have any features, it's just, it's pretty round, it's not a rapidly rotating uh, star, and then during the eclipse he saw this, what we call the Pac-Man formation, where this, uh, this disk started cutting into the bottom half of the star and obscuring it and blocking out the light to the point that as you go through, or as the eclipse proceeded, almost the entire bottom half of the star got blocked. The light from that uh, star got attenuated by the disk itself. On this image you can kind of see in the bottom right a little bit of the polar region of the, uh, the star can still be seen. Um, Brian Kloppenberg, if you Google Epsilon Origin, you more than likely will be able to see a composite image of all of his observations with the disk going through it. He was able to capture images throughout the entirety of the eclipse. It is, it is awesome. It is awesome. The other thing you can do with this, and this is in the microwave, so this is how, uh, this is between the radio, I guess technically it's radio, but radio and, and optical, and this is the microwave, and the advantages here um, are that now we knew that, we knew that um, stars form disks. We knew that planets formed from those disks, and we knew that from observations of Hubble. Those are on the left. We can see that normally these disks cannot be seen because they are faint with regards to their host stars. Um, think Firefly next to Floodland. But the uh, disks themselves are very dusty and very much like uh, Epsilon Auriga are very good at blocking out starlight. So if the dusts are, or the disks are inclined so that the light has to pass through the disk in order to get to you, then it's going to block out a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the light, and we can actually see the environment around the star and see that there is, in fact, a disk there. But those are few and far between. You, you needed to have an orientation like this, and the orientations can be random for all of these different stars. So just geometrically speaking, it's going to be a very rare, uh, rare occurrence that you would be able to see something on the left with Hubble. But now with interferometry, we're starting to be able to see systems that are basically face-on, where they are very inclined to our line of sight, and we can actually see the disk itself 
and actually structure within the disk, which we can't using the Hubble observations. And so now we can directly uh, we can directly observe planets forming in the present epoch, which is again amazing to me. Those rings are not some kind of Saturn's rings where they are, um, you know, where the the stuff is getting pushed around by uh, small moons or whatever. This stuff is getting pushed around because there is planets forming. There are planets sucking up that dust, uh, vacuuming up that dust, and also causing it to get plowed away due to gravitational instability. So those rings are due to active planetary formation. And again, based on the uh, light travel time, that is still going on as I'm talking about it. So, exciting stuff to me. So let's transition between uh, from talking about telescopes to talking about where you would want to put these telescopes. Where on Earth is Carmen San Diego and her telescope? So before we can really answer that question, we need to know what the atmosphere does to telescopic observations. And I'm just going to uh, spoil it for you right now. What you really want for optical anyway, for, an op uh, for a traditional telescope, is you want some place that's calm, meaning that the wind isn't very turbulent. You can have wind, but so long as it travels in a straight line. The wind travels from point A to point B in what we call a laminar flow, or a basically it doesn't, there's not a lot of uh, moving around left or right or up or down, it just travels straight left, uh, left to right, um, or one direction. You want to be really high up, and that's because you want to be as far, if you want to get, a, you, if you want to mitigate the effects of the atmosphere, mitigate the atmosphere. This is why space telescopes exist. We put, oh, we put telescopes in space to get it out of the atmosphere entirely because there are no mountains high enough that actually go above the entire atmosphere. That would be really weird. Um, so, But if you can't put it in space, put it as high up as possible so you're looking through as least amount of the atmosphere as possible. And as it happens, most, about 90% of the, uh, the atmosphere is actually within the first... 10 kilometers of the atmosphere. It becomes very rarefied very quickly as you get higher. So getting onto the Andes Mountains or getting onto Mauna Kea where you're 14,000 feet above the, um, above, the, uh, above the sea level, it's a pretty good start. It's a pretty good start to be that high up. Obviously you want it dark. Um, not a lot of uh, street lights around. And you want it dry. Which high up also gives you. Now, I love this map for a couple reasons. One, it's obviously a composite map. It is a composite map of the nighttime side of the Earth. And it shows you the amount of light pollution there is on the Earth. And this is actually a little bit dated. I think this is from maybe the mid, mid to late 90s. But what I love about it is not only just, you know, it's the it shows, oh my god, there's light pollution and all that, but it 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 I love it because it also shows the extent of human civilization. These this is where the humans are. Where you see light, that's where humans are, or at least large population centers of humans. So you can see like you can almost make out the line of the the, um, the Mississippi River, uh, because cutting basically the uh, the United States in half. We have the eastern states, which are densely populated, and you have the western states, which are not. You have Europe, which is also just covered in people. And then it peters out as you get to northern Asia and the more inhospitable Siberia, uh, Taiga environments. And then most of, most of the Hlema, you can see the, the area where the light kind of gets to a certain point in India and then just it hits a wall. Well, that wall is the Himalayan mountains. Um, so it just it's awesome to me to, to see this. Uh, the Sahara Desert, obviously, the, the outback, not a lot of uh, not a lot of things. But anyway, light pollution. Why is light pollution bad? Simply because the atmosphere, as I'm going to talk about, can be approximated by having little tiny part of the atmosphere does have um, little tiny particulates within with suspended in it, like smog, for example. And the molecules themselves, along with these particulates, can act as a, as a mirror or a lens. And so if you have any light which is emanating upward, it's going to hit that atmosphere, 
and it's going to redirect it downward. And it's going to cause the entire sky to appear brighter than it would ordinarily. And so what that means is that the if the overall sky is brighter, you can't see dimmer objects. So you want it to be as dark as possible so you can get full advantage of the aperture that you're using. The other problem that you have is twinkling. Those mirrors that I was talking about, those lenses that I was talking about that are suspended in the atmosphere, they're not just sitting there. They're moving. And so as they move, as they twist around and um, twirl around, they're going to bend and reflect light randomly. And so it's kind of like a game of Plinko, where the light comes in, hits one particle, gets redirected into another direction, it hits another one, gets redirected, and just Plinkos its way down to the Earth. And it's, it's a dynamic process. Like I said, all of that is in motion. And so when you see a star twinkling, for an astronomer, that's actually pretty bad. That means that the atmosphere is very unstable and you, the light is being basically just bounced around so much that the, light itself, that the star itself appears to be uh, doing a little dance on the sky. And so when you take an image of that, it blur that motion during the time that you are actually taking the image. Say you had a one second exposure, the amount of motion that you capture during that one second blurs out the image. So again, you lose the ability that are the the things that you gain from a large aperture, which is angular resolution, because of the pesky atmosphere causing things to bounce around. Now, if you are able to look at the so this is an example of a star looked at using just purely ground-based telescope, uh, and then that's roughly around the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope, and then looking at it through the Hubble, you can see the clarity that you get by being outside the atmosphere. All of that blurring, all that pixelization that you see there, that is caused by um, the atmosphere. Now, sometimes you don't need to be real high up in order to to get away from most of this uh, twinkling problem. I really wish I had remember. Or, although I don't know if my phone had the capability of, of recording video back then, or I didn't even think about it, but I really wish I had recorded video of this, because this is an uh, image that I took while on Mount Wilson, which is in uh, just north of um, LA on the San Gabriel Mountains. It's about 5,500 feet up. But it's not, it's not very high, astronomically speaking. But because of the way the, the climate is there, the marine layer doesn't quite gets close to the, uh, the top of the uh, mountain, but not above it. And so the air on the peak of the mountain of Mount Wilson is very, very calm. And a lot of the smog and the particulates get trapped in that marine layer. And that's one of the reasons why LA is known for its smog is not just because it's a large population area, but because of the the fact that the atmosphere or the climate there keeps all of that smog trapped by the um, by the San Gabriels. And so what I wanted to take a video of this for, the reason why I would take a video is obviously you can see a whole lot of light pollution. And Mount Wilson can't escape that. It had there are certain there's a certain brightness limit that you can't um, can't get away from because of all the light. Luckily with interferometry, you're light limited anyway, so that wasn't really a big, big issue. We really wanted angular resolution. That's what we were after. And that's what we got because Mount Wilson is one of the calmest sites in the world in terms of seeing, in terms of that turbulence. That turbulence really doesn't, um, doesn't uh, really affect. When you look up, you don't see the stars twinkle pretty much at all. But if you look down onto the LA and these street lights, they twinkle like mad. They just, it's, that's why I wanted a video, to show you just the, all these lights are just dancing around. And, um, it's just marvelous to, to look at. And so twinkling ha happens both ways. It happens from star stars passing through that marine layer, twinkling down, or it happens for street lights passing up through the marine layer to someone on a high place like uh, Mount Wilson. So the best observatory sites, at least for optical and infrared, are the very high or are calm, high, dark, dry areas, like the tops of mountains in Chile 
or a Mauna Kea in uh, Hawaii. So, how, do one, how does one overcome these atmospheric limitations? Well, one of them is obviously just to get rid of the atmosphere. Just, and by that I mean not, you know, in a Dr. Evil um, uh, space ball sort of way where you have a um, giant robot vacuuming out the atmosphere or anything of that nature. What I'm talking about is just putting telescopes into space. Um, just getting it away from the atmosphere itself. But what if you can't do that, or if you don't have Bezos kind of money, and you know you're on you're on you're NASA, you're on a budget. What do you do in order to mitigate this? Like I said, you can put this, the telescope as high up as possible, so you're looking through as little atmosphere as, as you can. But we're gotten we've gotten to the point that our telescopes are large enough that even that doesn't mitigate it enough. So what else can we do? What we can do is something called adaptive optics. We can make the mirrors of these reflecting telescopes thin enough that we can actually have pistons beneath them that can distort the mirror's shape in response to the distortions of the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere causes the, uh, the light to bend in this direction, then the, you know, we can cause the uh, mirror to bend in that direction. And therefore, basically, the, the mirror will, def uh, def will deform in such an, a way as to keep the light coming in as straight as possible and as turbulent less as pop uh, possible, as calm as possible. And so see here you can see, again, the, a planetary nebula where you have gas that was blown off the outer layers of a star with a white dwarf in the center of it, uh, illuminating the whole thing. The panel on the left illustrates um, what the uh, star looks like without adaptive optics, and the star on the image on the right shows you what the uh, image looks like with adaptive optics turned on. And so again, now you are getting with adaptive optics, you can actually get down to the angular resolution limit that your telescope allows you to see naturally, without um, because the so the atmosphere causes a lot of blurring, a lot of distortion. You will never be able to get down to that diffraction limit that I just uh, talked about at the beginning of this lecture. Adaptive optics work because you know how the star is actually changing, how the atmosphere is actually changing. Well, one of the things, one of the problems that adaptive optics has is some telescopes have a very, very narrow field of view, meaning they look at only a very, very small part of the sky because they are trying to look at very, very small things. Now, the way that we know that how the atmosphere is um, how the atmosphere is affecting the stars is by looking at a star very close to our target object. So, if we had a galaxy that we're looking at that we wanted to take very fine, detailed pictures of, we'd look at a star that was close to that galaxy at least on the sky, we would see how that star is vibrating, how that star is twinkling, and then we would correct the mirror so that the same twinkling that was affected galaxy gets washed out, gets basically subtracted out. Unfortunately, with telescopes like Gemini, the one seen here, the, the field of view is so small that occasionally you just don't see any stars around that galaxy that are good enough, that are bright enough to be used to make those corrections. So what do they do? This time they do do the Dr. Evil solution. They strap a laser beam to the top of its head. And that's what you're seeing here is a sodium laser being shot out into space. And what that laser will do is that it will hit a very high layer of the atmosphere and reflect down. And it will actually, from the telescope's perspective, appear where that laser beam hits the atmosphere it'll appear as if there is a star there. And so this is a what we call a guide star, or uh, basically it's a fake star uh, created by this laser. And here is an example of uh, that being used again, where you have on the left, you have uh, an image of something without adaptive optics, it just kind of looks like a blob. When you turn the adaptive optics on, you can now resolve these two things, not as two separate headlights, but as two separate stars. And so before, you would look at this and be like, okay, 
That's probably two stars because I can see a whole lot of uh, chemical elements that don't make sense together. But once you turn the adaptive optics on, you can look at it and be like, oh yeah, there's definitely two stars here. And if they're moving with respect to each other, you can actually measure that as well directly. So what about, what else does the atmosphere do? Well, thankfully for human life, the atmosphere acts as a shield. It acts as a way to block out harmful radiation. And that harmful radiation includes x-rays, it includes gamma rays, and it includes most of the UV, uh, UV light. The graph that you're seeing down here is, is the opacity of the atmosphere or the percentage of light which is transmitted through the uh, atmosphere. So if that line is high, that means the atmosphere is opaque. If that line is low or close to zero, that means the light actually hits the ground. And so you can see that for gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet, that the atmosphere is pretty much opaque, which is good because, again, we like to live, or at least I do, so I don't really want to be bombarded by gamma rays. Although turning into a green Hulk monster or rage monster is kind of appealing sometimes, particularly in rush hour traffic. But in, you can see with visible light, the atmosphere becomes transparent to um, to that to those wavelengths, which is probably from an evolutionary standpoint why we can see those particular wavelengths is because that the the atmosphere is uh, is transparent to those lights or to that light. In the infrared, it gets a little bit more hairy. Uh, there are pockets or peaks or valleys where we can, if we're high enough up, we can actually see. We can collect some infrared radiation, but uh, for the most part, uh, IR uh, observations have to be done, wait for it, via aircraft, which is also pretty freaking cool, or into space. Um, radio is wide open. Again, dirty, dirty cheaters. Most of the radio, um, most of the uh, atmosphere is opaque, or excuse me, is transparent, completely transparent to radio. So, the atm so they don't have to worry about the atmosphere really at all. Like I said, they can shoot through clouds. Not thick clouds, but clouds. And then you get into long uh, wavelength uh, radio, which is good because we have the ionosphere, and that allows us to have global communication you know, before satellites and stuff because we could bounce radio waves off, of the, uh, off the atmosphere, and it would bounce around to the opposite side of the globe. So this is a picture of Arecibo. Um, I've already kind of, the next couple of slides I'm going to go through fairly quickly because I've already um, babbled on about uh, interferometry and radio uh, astronomy. Here's the example of the Arecibo dish, or if you're a, a Bond aficionado, you might have noticed this is where Sean Bean dies. Um, yes, in um, GoldenEye, they actually have the Bond villain layer be a volcano. This is a dormant volcano covered in water, um, or submerged underwater, and then the water goes away when you can see it. Anyway, so yeah, so getting back to reality, astronomers actually put a telescope in a dormant volcano. Diabolical. Thousand foot. They can't move it. When Arecibo was functional, a thousand foot dish is not movable. It's not steerable. So you can see suspended above the dish is the camera. And so instead of moving the telescope around to see different parts of the uh, sky, it moved the camera around basically to see different parts of the sky by where the light was being reflected. It was limited, but the amount of resolution that this was that this gained back in the uh, 70s and 80s was unprecedented uh, before interferometry really, really started taking off. Uh, this is an image, uh, this is a computer-generated image of what Alma is going to look like. Um, well, I guess what Alma does look like, but what Alma will grow into, um, which is an array of microwave uh, of, of telescopes. But again, it's interferometry is a way to make things, uh, in, interferometry is used in order to gain the resolution of a far larger telescope. So imagine with these particular telescopes, each of these is fairly modest in size, but you can see there are specks of them in the background. You can get, uh, I can't remember this one, but there is a, 
there's a microwave array in South Africa called the square kilometer away, uh, array because it literally will be a square kilometer in size. The array is going to have uh, is going to have individual telescopes within a square kilometer of, of distance. So interferometry allows you to have better angular resolution. This is not the Hubble Space Telescope. Haha. -ha. This is a mock-up of the James Webb Telescope, which probably is a NASA conspiracy and probably will never uh, will never actually fly because of the uh, many, many times it's been delayed. But anyway, the Hubble Space Telescope is iconic. The Hubble Space Telescope, you know, if you look up, you, you type in Whirlpool Galaxy into Google, and you do an image search. The most common image is going to be an image taken by the Hubble, tel Hubble Space Telescope. But the Hubble... The tele if you took Hubble out of the sky and put it on the Earth, it really wouldn't be worth noticing. It's only a 1.3 meter telescope. We now have 10 meter telescopes. The reason why the Hubble is so impactful is because it is in space, because it can um, see so much further away, or because it, can, it doesn't have to worry about blurring, it doesn't have to worry about adaptive optics, it, can li it, it has no... The only limitations it has on it is that which is built into it. And so the James Webb Telescope is the next generation. It's going to be much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, but the same idea in principle. And in actuality, the James Webb is... Oh, there's the Hubble. It's in the upper left. The James Webb is actually going to be a uh, su successor not to Hubble, but to Spitzer. And Spitzer is the one on the bottom. And that was the infrared telescope, which was about the same size as the Hubble. But remember, angular resolution decreases as you go to longer wavelengths. So Spitzer did not have, did not have quite the imaging capability that Hubble did the, uh, with its uh, angular resolution. And so the um, and that's also that's completely wrong too. It's, the space telescope is not on the bottom image. It's or the top image. It's in the bottom image. Anyway, that's I, I really need I really f these these slides up. Anyway, so um, hopefully there are no kids watching. So this is the Spitzer uh, space. Uh, so this is Spitzer. This was was a marvel of engineering achievement when it was put uh, put in. Unfortunately, the amount of coolant needed to to because in the infrared. You're looking at heat, and so the uh, so the telescope itself has to be immensely cold in order for it not to contribute to background radiation or background noise. But eventually, the uh, the coolant has run out, and so Spitzer, unfortunately, while it surpassed its lifespan, its projected lifespan, it was over-engineered. Thankfully, um, it is now uh, kind of defunct as a uh, science gaining instrument, and so hopefully, James Webb will be. Put in orbit, and we'll actually be able to carry on doing the science that both Hubble and Spitzer were uh, designed to do um, moving forward. And then, lastly, I want to talk about X-ray and gamma ray uh, science. Again, thankfully, because of the fact that um, um, because of the fact that uh, the the atmosphere is opaque, and you know we can survive here. Uh, because the uh, there are no X-rays or gamma rays bombarding the surface. If you are interested in doing X-ray or gamma ray uh, astronomy, you are you are stuck doing one of two things: either putting an instrument on a balloon and floating it to the very very top of the atmosphere, and then uh, for a very short time observing uh, observing the sky before the balloon itself pops, or putting a telescope into space. Uh, XM, XMM Newton or Chandra. Uh, both of these are X-ray and gamma ray telescopes uh, that have very uh, have produced amazing results, groundbreaking work. The reason why you would want to look in X-ray and gamma ray, we'll get the, uh, into that more later on. But particularly if you're interested in very very high energy physics, like supernova, for example, or the uh, the nuclear the or AGNs the uh, nuclear furnaces that are inside the cores of, of galaxies. Uh, these are exceedingly high energy uh, events or high energy environments, and the only way to really probe those um, those environments is by looking into the X-ray or gamma ray parts of the spectrum. Um, 
you can sort of infer how bright or how what's going on based on how that affects lower um, or longer wavelength observations. But to really get to the meat of it, to really be able to see it directly, you need these um, these uh, these telescopes in orbit, and they are engineering feats of in and upon themselves. All right, I think the this lecture has gone on long enough, and so I'm going to leave it here. Uh, next time, we will talk about the Big Bang. All right, hope you enjoyed.